Thank you very much. So welcome everybody. My name is Ulrich Pfeiffer. I'm with the University of Wuppertal in Germany and I'm going to talk about radio front ends for 100 gigabits per second and beyond. And as you see in the title, I haven't dared to put uh, 6D down somehow uh, and I'll leave it kind of up to you guys and to the discussion later on if you, you want to call this 6G or maybe 7G. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm more of a hardware person um, and I would like to give you a little bit of perspective from a hardware guy um, and I'd like to give you some performance metrics to see where we are at the moment and where things are going to. Um, so, um, as, a, as a hardware guy or a circuit designer uh, perspective, um, we as a circuit guy, we are following basically the, the, the pursuit to unlimited bandwidth. Yeah? So, we, we started out in the microwave range moved up in the millimeter wave range, um, and then into the sub-millimeter wave range, that's the next thing. Um, many people talk about the terahertz range when it comes to sub-millimeter waves. And as you see, there are a different kind of communities that are addressing this frequency band. Um, you know, the green uh, part here is addressed by the photonics community for a very, very long time. And uh, we are kind of new to this uh, field as an, as an electronic engineer. Um, so this is the red part, which I think is something that can be addressed easily with the current state-of-the-art silicon technologies. And this is something we need to talk a little bit about uh, because many of the applications that we are talking about here require um, you know, uh, economies of scale. We really have to bring down the cost and silicon technologies are, are really a key enabler for, for this application in the future. So um, now let's look into the uh, applications that we could address with uh, silicon. And in the past, the photonic people really have done a lot of imaging at these high frequencies before, but slowly you see also silicon technologies that move into this domain. And we have seen even terahertz cameras implemented in standard uh, CMOS technologies uh, that are USB operated, very low power. Uh, they can be hooked up to automation robots and you have seen handheld sources which run from a 1.5 volt battery. So things can be done um, and of course there are also many other high volume applications that slowly move in. Um, automotive radar of course moves up the frequency ladder the same way as many other applications and ultimately of course the communication has the high volumes that people that are designing silicon circuits are looking for. And uh, just recently last year there also has opened up an IEEE standard. Uh, the 802.15.3D 2017, which opens up the frequency band from 252 to 322 gigahertz for communication applications. Now, um, the question though is, um, can we implement uh, something in silicon? So can we, can we design a terahertz radio front end? Now, when you think about uh, implementing this in silicon, of course, you may wonder about the technology that's available. And let's look into the most advanced and fastest technologies that we have today. And this is a silicon germanium bipolar technology. And uh, when you look back 10 years where we started at, um, we had cutoff frequencies, which means the F max, the maximum frequency of oscillation of a silicon transistor at the order of about 200 gigahertz. Now that has gone through a number of technology improvement cycles. Um, you know, we went up to uh, 500 gigahertz in 2010, and even now we moved up to 700 gigahertz. So the performance of those transistors has increased substantially, and that opens up a lot of new applications in communication and also moves up, of course, in this domain towards 6G and beyond. Now, the question though is, can we implement a generic communication transceiver? And this is shown here, something like a double balanced Gilbert cell up conversion or down conversion mixer. Um, and uh, of course, um, when you are talking about this very large bandwidth, then one of the approaches is that you are trying to get away with a very low spectral efficiency and really try to leverage the large bandwidth that's available at these high frequencies. Uh, and, uh, and then you, you start wondering about what kind of link budget do I actually have when I go into this. And you will very quickly figure out that um, it is kind of challenging um, because uh, when you even assume some of the more conventional um, achievable parameters here like output power on the order of 6 dBm, maybe noise figure of 10 dB, you will very quickly see that uh, there's something missing because if you don't have any antenna gain on your transmitters and receivers, you really end up in a very, very small range. And only with antenna gain really you can get up to something that's useful in the order of meters that we are talking about when we try to do communication. 
And, uh, and all that needs to be trade off against each other. So the circuit design challenge here really is to find the optimum between these different kind of parameters. And antenna gain and packaging is one of the key things that we have to uh, address in the future. Now, this is what we had in mind. So um, then we started off uh, looking into some of the uh, architectural design trade-offs here. And there's a transmitter block diagram here on the top, as you see. And there are two receivers that I would like to show you and discuss a little bit the various kind of trade-offs that you have. Now, we don't have to go really into details of how these block diagrams uh, work out. Um, maybe one of the important things, though, to mention is that this is a tunable LO. So you can change the reference frequency to address different kind of carriers from 220 to 260 gigahertz. That, of course, is not the RF bandwidth. The RF bandwidth is smaller than this. It's just the LO reference. And then the other thing that you may notice is that there are antennas now uh, in these block diagrams. Maybe at lower frequencies, you have not seen this as part of the transceivers. But the wavelengths get small enough so that you can finally integrate the antennas also on the silicon chip. And if you look into the actual dye micrographs, you see them here. You see that the antenna here is on the right side, for instance, uh, on the transmitter on the top. And you see the two receivers, left and right, that I would like to talk about. And uh, you see the LO generation part is actually pretty large. So a lot of area is required on the chips to actually get up to these signals. Uh, so higher frequencies. Um, are not very efficient to, to generate, and therefore you need not only a lot of DC power, you also need a lot of area on a silicon chip to implement that function. The other thing you see is that packaging is getting important, as I mentioned, and you need to get up to the very high directivity antennas. And the on-chip antennas itself, they're not directive enough, so you have to do something else. Either you would increase the aperture, which means you have to move to phased arrays, for instance, um, integrate, uh, you know, tens or hundreds of antennas, or you can use a silicon lens. And this is what we've done here. So you see, um, we actually have glued the chip to a silicon lens. And, uh, and this way, the on-chip antenna is kind of the, the, the primary feed of the antenna, whereas the lens is the secondary antenna. And that gives you a very good directivity of 26 dBi. And this is really important to understand that this is required um, to really bridge some distance. And here you see some of the um, prototype modules where you see the silicon lens. Um, you can also cool this um, and use pretty standard FR4 technology. So uh, except for the lens, there's really only silicon here uh, involved and low-cost FR4. Now let's look into some of the measured results. And this is, of course, important to, to see if, if we can get the performance done. And here you see the transmitter um, RF bandwidth for different kind of IF drive powers. Of course, you can saturate this. And an important number here is, of course, output power that you would like to figure out. And, and this is actually radiated power, so you can get very close to 10 milliwatts. 10 dBm is something that you can generate these days in a silicon process. Um, the LO is tunable, 220 to 260 gigahertz. And then, of course, what really is of, course, of interest is the RF bandwidth. And you can get something like a 3 dB RF bandwidth of 25 gigahertz. Um, that's a pretty large bandwidth. And the question is, how do we leverage this? Um, and if you look into the receivers, I was presenting you two versions here, uh, one that has an uh, amplifier right after the antenna. And on the right side, uh, we, we omitted the amplifier. And we go directly into the receiver mixer. And you see, um, although you, you cover kind of a similar kind of carrier frequency, you see that the RF bandwidth, when you look at it, um, is a bit smaller here in the amplifier one, because many of these amplifiers, they are highly tuned, and they limited the bandwidth. Whereas on the right side, this implementation here has a little bit larger bandwidth, up to 28 gigahertz. And if you mix this down, you get an IF bandwidth here of 14 gigahertz. Now, uh, the other thing, of course, is uh, when you omit the amplifier, um, of course, you have a higher noise figure. You see this here. The noise figure here is slightly higher than on this version. Here, you can get down below 10 dB. Here, you are above 13 dB. No? So the question is, is this noise figure really the only a measure that we have to, to judge the performance of those circuits. And we'll see it's not because there are many other impairments of these links that matter. Yes, so let's look first into a short demonstration how that looks like. So you have these boards mounted here on a rail, um, transmitter here, receiver there. And you can directly take an antenna signal, let's say a DVB-T signal from an antenna and send it in as an IF signal. Because it's so wideband, you can directly uh, go through your transceivers and then hook it up to a TV to demonstrate that it works. And if you put in your hands, of course, you're going to block the signal. 
Uh, you can also go through cardboards. That's a very interesting demonstration of Terra's radiation that it is not uh, actually reflected from dry materials or absorbed from dry materials. All right, but of course you would like to demonstrate data rates, so we have to move on to something that's more um, a type of a test equipment, and you need real-time, very fast oscilloscopes and arbitrary waveform generators, which is shown here in a demo setup. And that, of course, pushes also the capability of the test equipment because you have to feed a very high data rate, um, complex modulated data into these transmitters, and then also have a real-time scope to sample that fast enough. So here there also we are hitting the limitations of the test equipment that's currently available. And when you look at the results here first, uh, with the amplifier first uh, receiver, you see some of the 16 QAM uh, cancellations that we measured up to 90 gigabits. And here on the top right chart, of course, you see um, the EVM and respective uh, bit error rates here over the uh, LO reference or carrier frequency. Um, and you see that uh, that really uh, you know, is able to, uh, to get up to um, you know, very high data rates up to 90 gigahertz per second. And uh, of course, also interesting is how high we can get up to the right side here. In particular, if you would like to address this IEEE standard, there we would like to move uh, close to the 300 gigahertz. Um, so here you see another summary of the two implementations, mixer first receiver here on the right side and the amplifier first one. And because of the slightly larger and flatter bandwidth of the mixer first, uh, actually in this uh, implementation, we were even able to get up to 100 gigabits per second with an EVM of 17 percent. So this is um, pretty, a pretty good number, um, although you may wonder about the range, and this is something we need to talk a little bit about. So this data was measured over one meter range. Um, if you go further, you have to drop down in data rate. So at 1.8 meter already, you're down to 80 gigabits per second. Now, and the reason for this is, of course, um, that there are many other uh, impairments of the hardware. So it's not only the SNR, the signal-to-noise ratio, uh, that you have. You also have to worry about the uh, uh, spurious free dynamic range. Uh, you, you need very clean LO signals. Also, you need to make sure um, that on the receiver side, you have a good LO to IF isolation. And uh, that as, as, as soon as you make your IF bandwidth wide enough, um, then you're really running into these impairments, these unwanted signals here into the right side. And that's the reason why you have to um, then at some point um, have to lower your data rate. And this is something that we are addressing, of course, in the circuit design. And this is also summarized here again. So as, as long as you stay below 50, gigahertz, uh, 50 gigabits per second, you're really only limited by phase noise and SNR. And as you increase your IF bandwidth, then you're running into these harmonics um, and that then kind of raises the EVM and therefore uh, at some point limits the, the achievable data rates. And only here above 90 gigahertz really you have the external IF2 baseband leakage which is a problem. Now with this uh, hardware, uh, when you look at the channel allocations out of the IEEE standard that's available, you see these yellow parts, these are the, the bands that we are finally can address with this chipset. Um, so of course, the, the bandwidth here is, is quite narrow, so we cannot get the 100 gigabits in the standard yet. Um, but uh, at lower frequencies, as you have seen, at 230 gigahertz, we, we have these 100 gigabits per second available over one meter. But when you look in the standard, uh, the people are talking about much larger ranges. So the question is what we have to do to even go further than a meter, because that's not enough for many of the applications that we have in mind. Um, so you can go back to your link budget, basically, and see what would have to be done to go from the 26 dBi lens gain that we have to something like 50 dBi. And if you have that on the transmitter and receiver, of course, then from the link budget, you would be able to get to 100 meters with this. Um, then, of course, your lens needs to increase to something like 6.5 centimeters. So this is, this is the aperture of what we are typically have, 
talking about when we talk about handheld devices. No? So it is within range um, that we can get it, but it's a very directive beam, of course. That's why we need to look into beam steering um, capabilities of the hardware that we are able to steer this very narrow beam over this large distance. Just for your reference, I've included here some of the uh, state-of-the-art hardware implementations that we've seen on transceivers. And if you see, if you compare this uh, technology here, this is done in a silicon germanium process, as I mentioned, with the existing implementations. You see that only 100 gigabits per second so far uh, had to be done in an indium phosphate uh, technology. Uh, so silicon there is creeping up in terms of performance and is an interesting um, option that in particular addresses this, these very high volumes that we are looking for for commercial applications. Now this brings me um, to the summary of my talk. So you've seen there are uh, plenty of opportunities and in the past many of them were limited to imaging and sensing applications whereas the communication now really is uh, getting more and more uh, attention. And you have seen that the hardware is able to give us something like 100 gigabits per second over a meter or even up to 100 meters if you start adding extra uh, antenna gain there. Future challenge, of course, is to improve the, the link performance. So there's plenty of stuff to do for us hardware engineers. And uh, if, you, if you go beyond the RF uh, front end, of course, um, there's a lot of stuff missing, um, and that's the baseband. No? So really, on the baseband side, you have to have something that can actually handle these kind of large IF bandwidths. And this is an unsolved problem so far. We have not seen, beside this very expensive test equipment, that there's anything that can handle these kind of very large IF and RF bandwidths. No? Very important thing to remember. So this uh, closes my presentation. And uh, I hope we will be able to close the 6G gap and find the right applications that can actually drive um, our hardware here forward in frequency and to communication applications in the future. So that brings me to the end. I would just like to thank all my PhD students, of course, who has, have contributed to the work here and some of the funding agencies as well. Thank you very much for your attention.